Um, hi, this is uh, Progressive Short Takes, and I'm your host, uh, Joe Firestone. What I'll talk about uh, this afternoon is avoiding the descent into fascism. So, recently there was an article in Common Dreams, and the article was about a letter that was written by experts in fascism warning of dark days ahead. The article appeared in Common Dreams, as I said. It was written by Brett uh, Wilkins, a staff writer over there on November 2nd. And the headline is warning of dark days ahead, quote unquote, historians of fascism stress, quote, it is not too late, unquote, to avoid descent into authoritarianism. And they warn, quote, we believe that unless we take immediate action, democracy as we know it will continue in its frightening regression, irrespective of who wins the American presidency, the scholars warn. There were over 80 historians of fascism and authoritarianism from around the world signed an open letter Sunday, warning that American democracy is in an existential peril and urging people to take action now before it's too late to save it. They said this is regardless of the outcome of the election. Democracy as we know it is already imperiled. Uh, they then proceeded uh, to outline, well, to say that it is not too late to turn uh, the tide. And they outlined some guidance on how we could avoid the descent into fascism. These are the points they made. First, by boldly and unapologetically safeguarding critical thinking based on evidence, including by supporting investigative journalism, science and the humanities, and uh, freedom of the press. Now, um, I have to wonder, okay, I have to wonder how that can be implemented, how that is guidance. In other words, it tells us what we need to do in the area, what we need to accomplish, okay, in the area of safeguarding critical thinking based on evidence. But supporting investigative journalism, science, um, and the humanities and freedom of the press is vague. We don't know what that means. Exactly. All the main media organizations have cut back on investigative journalism. They're not doing investigative journalism. They don't support investigative journalists. It runs contrary to their business model to support investigative uh, journalists. We need structures in our society that will provide that support. How do we create these uh, structures? How do we safeguard uh, the freedom of the press? Uh, we have uh, uh, um, Ed um, uh, Snowden um, essentially a prisoner um, in Russia. I'm not, I'm not saying that he's kept as a prisoner there. I'm saying he cannot travel beyond Russia because otherwise we would pick him up and prosecute him. Uh, but, um, but, um, but Julian Assange is currently being persecuted by us um, um, in the UK and has been for a long time. The leading symbol of the freedom of the press right now. How can that be stopped? It can't be stopped um, if Joe Biden doesn't want to stop it. So why don't the scholars say the president of the United States has to stop 
taking actions that are inimical to the freedom of the press? How about the violations of the freedom of the press that occur in protests in the United States, where local police are beating up on the press, tear gassing the press? How are we going to stop that without cleaning up our institutions first? It's easy to say safeguard uh, uh, by critical thinking. But where is critical thinking safeguarded? Is it safeguarded on Facebook? Is it safeguarded um, on YouTube? Is it safeguarded, okay, on other social media? Is it safeguarded in the mainstream media? We need big changes to have that happen. And those big changes have to come from the bottom up. These scholars don't say how these big changes are going to occur. Next. Securing commitments from corporate media organizations and governments to tackle the dangers of misinformation and media concentration. We know that media concentration is one of the big sources of misinformation in our society. The only way for governments to tackle the dangers of media concentration and hence of disinformation being circulated by the big media is to break up those media. It's not a matter of commitments from the corporate media um, organizations. It's a matter of depriving them of their power. We've got structural reforms that have to be made to the system by a superior power. The only superior to do superior power to do this is the government of the United States. And the only way the government of the United States is going to do it is if the government of the United States is taken over from the bottom up by democratic forces that have the will to do it, that consider media concentration okay, and media disinformation to be things that cannot be tolerated because they're anti-democratic. We might have had a chance to do something about um, the media concentration and the corporate media organizations if we had been able to do something about the political parties and get candidates like, uh, like Bernie Sanders nominated for the highest okay, of our offices. But our political parties are blocking the rise of such figures because they're dangerous to corporate profits. Third, building coalitions organized across differences of race, class, gender, religion, and caste, and respecting the perspectives and experiences okay, of others. How can we build um, 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 coalitions across these identity categories when all we do in the United States is to emphasize identity politics and the importance of playing um, identity politics. The only way we're going to get rid of these identity subdivisions or organize coalitions across these particular subdivisions is to emphasize similarities of economic interest across the races, across the classes, across the genders, across religious groups, and caste groups. Are these scholars um, advocating that we have more class politics? I don't see it in, these, uh, in this list okay, of recommendations. Revealing and denouncing any and all connections between those in power and those uh, by vigilante and militia forces using political violence to destabilize our democracies. That is easy to say. Easy to say. But people voted for Trump knowing that he was friendly to vigilante and militia forces in 2016. And after four years of continual encouragement of these forces, too many people voted for him again. Lots of people have been revealing and denouncing the connections 
of these forces to Trumpism and the connection of these forces to Trump himself, <clears throat> but that doesn't do enough to break the connections. How do we break the connections? I think we can only break the connections by removing the underlying causes of the existence of the vigilante and militia forces. What are the underlying causes? I don't think they're addressed in this particular list. Being pre prepared to defend um, um, democracy and uh, pluralism against the growing dangers of communal violence and authoritarianism at the ballot box, but if necessary, also through nonviolent protest in the streets. Let's get one thing clear from the get-go if you're really serious about a democracy and you're really serious about getting rid okay, of fascism. Nonviolent protest in the streets is a right of citizens. It is part of democracy. There's no, if necessary, um, involved here. Nonviolent protest in the streets is something we need to be encouraging, that we need to make a safe space for, because that's what happens in a bottom-up democracy. And there's no such thing as a top-down democracy. A top-down democracy, by definition, is not a democracy. The pluralist style democracies we had in the 1950s and 1960s that we so much admired okay, and liked were not bottom-up democracies. That was the trouble with them. That's why over time they could evolve into neoliberal structures and eventually into fascism because the elites weren't renewed and circulated quickly enough in these particular democracies because there was no circulation coming from the bottom up. Real democracy, as Bernie Sanders is fond of saying, comes from the bottom up, from the bottom on up, not from the top on down. And he is quite right about that. But where is that bottom up perspective here? in this list okay, of recommendations about how to avoid the descent into fascism. Defending the integrity of the electoral process and ensure the widest possible voter turnouts, not just in this election, but in every election, large and small, in all of our hometowns. Come on. We know we have to do that. We know that would be wonderful. But without a overwhelming electoral victory, by forces who want to defend the integrity of the electoral process and who want to encourage the widest possible voter turnouts. We're not going to get that. We're not going to get that from the Republicans who have benefited from undermining the integrity of the electoral process. And by the way, the Democrats have undermined the integrity of the, of the electoral process too. When it comes to their primary elections, they've rigged it up and down and across the country. We know the discrepancies between the exit polls, where there have been exit polls, and the actual results in the primary elections. We can see that this gap is way outside what would be predicted by the statistics of the situation, impossibly outside. We know the only thing that can account for that is machine rigging of the vote. What are we going to do about that? How can we get the people who are doing this out of the process? How can we retire them? How can we change them? None of that is spoken of here. There are no suggestions for doing that here. There are only suggestions for getting to sub-goals, which are very nice to have. But we all know about these things. We all know these are nice to have. We all want to have them. Uh, the final, recommitting to a global conversation on support for democratic institutions, laws, and practices 
both within and between our, our, uh, our respective countries. Now, all of this guidance is good in telling us about some desirable things we need, but it's empty in terms of telling us how to get there from the place that we are in uh, right now. When prophets are feeding what passes for a journalism right now, when prophets seem to be dependent in our current system right now, seem to be dependent on sensationalism okay, of various kinds, when prophets come over everything, how are we going to get rid of the pure motivation of profit in our corporate media um, organizations. Back in the 50s, okay, in 1960s, um, profits were not the main goals in our newspapers then. Were not the main goals in our media. Um, covering the news was much more the main goals. I mean, think about it. Even as late as the 1970s, this was the case. Now it's just profits and further media concentration. That's been going on since the 80s when we allowed the media concentration to occur. When we just thought, well, bigness by itself wasn't a problem. It was no crime. Bigness by itself was a problem. It consolidated the oligarchy. We have a consolidated um, oligarchy facing us right now. If we can't get rid of the oligarchy, none of these very fine things that are mentioned here are going to come to pass. So, why won't these scholars of authoritarianism, authoritarianism and fascism, with all their scholarship, what have they learned about, well, quote, we need to turn away from the rule by entrenched elites and return to the rule of law, unquote. Okay, the letter includes. Yes, we know we have to do that. How can we do that? We must replace the politics of internal enemies with the politics of adversaries in a healthy democratic marketplace, K okay, of ideas. Oh, really? Look at the politics of the Democratic Party. When Bernie Sanders was getting close to the nomination, what did the rest of that party do? They all unified to defeat the, <coughs> the internal enemy. They viewed Bernie Sanders as an internal enemy. They weren't looking at a politics cave of adversaries. If they had been, they would never all have unified in back of Joe Biden at the behest of Obama, who above all wanted to protect the corporate elites running the Democratic Party through their donations, the donor elites. He wanted to protect them. Why did he want to protect them? He is getting richer and richer and richer due to their largesse since he retired from the presidency. That was obviously his plan all along, his motive all along. It is they who consider the progressive left as the internal enemy. It is they who want no part of us. It is they who look at us as not just being political uh, adversaries, but internal enemies. So what can we do to persuade them that for everybody's good, not just ours, but their own good um, as well, they have to stop considering us as internal enemies and play fair and square. If the people want uh, the progressive left to take over the Democratic Party, then let it be. Um, but let it happen. Don't fight to the last the breath and use every stratagem and every tactic you possibly can to throw the left out. 
but to throw us away from the table. How is that going to happen? Are these people aware of the dirty tricks that were played during the elections of 2016 and 2020 to exclude uh, the left in the United States from power? Are they aware of all the stratagems and tactics that were used to do this in the post-World War II period? Starting with the problem of marginalizing um, Henry Wallace? Come on, we're all aware of the history. We all know what's going on. We need advice about how to get people to play fair how to get people to have a sense of honor, how to get people to have a real faith in democracy from the bottom up. Unless you can advise us about how to do that, then your advice, the advice of these hundred scholars, is worth very little. We all know that all these things are good things to do. But how can we break the power of the entrenched elites in order to create these sub-goals that in turn we need to do to move towards democracy once again? When you can tell us that um, um, in a letter, that will be valuable. Until you can do it, um, but you're nowhere. Steve Silberman tweets, as a star and who's written about the Holocaust, I'll tell you, Trump and that Fox News pundit praising the goons who tried to run the Biden-Harris bus off the road is straight up fascism. It's not, quote, like, unquote, fascism. It's fascism. I completely agree. It's fascism. So what are you going to do about these goons? How are you going to uh, basically... How are you going to disappear the movement of goons? You've got to take away the motivation that is making them goons. What is it? What are the underlying causes? I think a lot of you who wrote uh, this letter, who signed this letter, a lot of you know what the causes are but you don't address these causes in these particular recommendations. If you did, you would be listing political platforms having some resemblance to the Bernie Sanders platform. And you would be talking about um, um, implementing such a platform to get rid of creeping authoritarianism and dissent towards um, fascism, because what you're talking about here is all form and no substance. It's not about substantive policy. We need substantive policy that specifies and implements a commitment to justice, broad scale, social and economic justice for people who are losing their place in society. According to the Protect Democracy Project, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, quote, dedicated to fighting attacks from at home and abroad on our right to free, fair, and fully informed self-government, unquote. The U.S. scores 56 out of 100 on its Democracy Threats Index, released on October 25th indicating a, quote, substantial erosion, unquote, of democracy, and signifying, quote, high potential for breakdown um, in the future, unquote. I couldn't agree more with that. I couldn't agree more. We're in danger. We're in terrible danger. We're still in terrible danger. Uh, the fascist president may be on the point of leaving, but the fascist party that enabled the fascist president is still in power in the Senate of the United States. Even in these last couple of days, Mitch McConnell, 
is encouraging uh, is encouraging Donald Trump to continue to fail to concede to Joe Biden and retire quietly to wherever he's going to retire to. Instead, instead, they're encouraging him to stay in politics. They're encouraging him to continue to be active. They're encouraging him to fight for the last breath to stay in the presidency so he can use it for his own private gain which we all know is what he's been doing. Have these people abandoned him? No, McConnell and Barr just had a meeting. What they discussed fully in this meeting is not known. Undoubtedly, it's a strategy having some sophistication. They hope that this uh, strategy uh, will lead to a situation where perhaps where they can get rid of Trump without making Trump and his supporters angry. So the rage of those supporters turns on them. I mean, it's a manipulation. It's not an honest approach to the situation. They don't make honest approaches to situations. That would be too democratic. Anyway, I was very disappointed in this particular letter, we don't need warnings that we're becoming a fascist country. We are all fully aware of that. At least half the population is fully aware of it, and the other half don't seem to care. So we don't need warnings like that. We need letters that tell us what to do about it. For all the reasons I've stated, the advice given here is not practical advice. It tells us what we should be accomplishing, but it doesn't tell us how to accomplish the things we should be accomplishing. So that's it for this progressive short take. I hope you liked it. God, it's another long short take. Sorry, folks. <laughs> anyway. I'm going to end this now, and I'll be back with another shorter take. I hope.